morning, good morning. Mark chapter 3. This morning will be our text. We conclude chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. Um, before that, before we get into that, um, today is a special day, um, being Palm Sunday. Today we, in a sense, commence Passion Week all the way through a focus that we ultimately need to have on the Lord. Let me read to you the events that occurred on this day. Matthew chapter 21, it says in verse 8, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And it is with that focus that we draw your attention to the word this morning. Um, this, this week, just move slowly through the course of this week um, as we focus on the, um, the betrayal, the arrest, uh, the crucifixion on Friday. And then ultimately we look forward to celebrating his resurrection uh, one week from today. Um, there's a lot of uh, exciting things, a lot of moving pieces and parts uh, right now at Big Woods. Uh, I think just of the next three weeks, um, next uh, Sunday, of course, we'll be over at uh, uh, Cassidy and Fireground together, which is always a privilege to celebrate Easter Uh, The very following week after that, uh, we'll be celebrating a baptism. And I think there's already four or five individuals that have committed to be obedient to the Lord um, and follow Him in the waters of baptism. And let me draw your attention as well to April the 10th. Um, Let let me just say I am so excited. and You've been patiently, patiently waiting for updates. Uh, I will simply tell you that God um, has granted many, many answers to our prayer. And doors are opening for us that we were at some point perplexed as far as the timing. Uh, and God is moving and moving in neat and exciting ways. And so we encourage you to be there together. We'll be back over. I know that's a lot of work, but it's important for us to be together with you. Celebrate what God has already done and what we anticipate the Lord doing as we look forward to beginning uh, to move forward uh, with our getting into another place to worship together on a regular basis so we don't have to pack up sound equipment and chairs on a regular basis. That will get very, very old very, very fast. So a lot of exciting things happening, particularly over the next couple of weeks. But today we draw your attention to the last few verses of Mark chapter 3. Um, let me just tell you right out of the gate, this message will upset you. The reason that I know it will upset you is because it upset me. Um, God's truth is piercing at times, but it is necessary and important, and we submit to the authority of the Word of God. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me as we get into our text from Mark chapter 3 this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we submit to your authority and to your word, and we rejoice in the presence of your spirit that is here even even at this very moment. Father, I thank you for each person that's here. I thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in our midst as a local church. We rejoice, Lord, that as we move into this week, we, we pause in the significance of the events. As we commemorate your death for us on the cross, the pain, the suffering, the agony to free us and to rescue us, to redeem us, to give us hope and ultimately, Lord, just to give us life. Father, we look forward to next Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection. We have so much to be grateful for. Father, as we now pause and We allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us through your word. I would ask, Lord, that you would give listening um, and open hearts. Father, that we would always seek, Lord, to to surrender to you and to 
uh, be obedient to you as we look at the importance of this morning. Your will over ours. It's a constant battle. Father, in our flesh we lose every time and so we allow your spirit and we ask your spirit to take reign and authority and rule. Father, we just thank you so much for the hope that exists in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, guard my mind and my lips, my mouth from saying anything that would not ultimately bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. We plead and we beg for your guidance now. We ask this in the strong name of our saved Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You and I are well aware that there is a major, major crisis that exists in our culture and our society today, and it is surrounded around the subject of family. Uh, a report from the U.S. Census Bureau indicates that 40% of all babies born in the United States at this, at this point will be born to un married mothers. Forty percent, four out of ten kids are born into a home where there's not a, a mother and a father together. What's interesting is not just the, the, the epidemic divorce rate that exists in our culture. It's actually the fact that people are choosing not to get married. As a matter of fact, if you look at most studies in, in, in urban settings, uh, kids have never even attended a wedding before. They have no idea what a wedding is, what a ceremony, because nobody gets married any longer. Uh, We know that Satan loves to cause distraction um, and a focus off of God's design for a family. We want to examine how we handle this idea. There's there's a, a very interesting story that made the news just this past week of a Chicago White Sox baseball player, Adam LaRoche, who, who walked away from a $13 million contract because he wasn't allowed to bring his son with him. He wasn't allowed to be together as a family. And, and as he retired from baseball, there was a hashtag in his Twitter account that says, Family First. Personally, I love the testimony of Adam LaRoche. He's a brother in the Lord's. But I also challenge the idea... That it's really not just family first. It's actually bigger than that. It is, it is, according to what we see in Scripture, it is to be God first and family second. Now please understand that Adam LaRoche very clearly says everything, everything that he has ever been blessed with is a result of God and that he is a recipient of God's grace. And we understand that. I'm not trying to be critical in any stretch right there. We have this idea that we live with a mantra that says family first, family first. Yes, family is ultimately very, very important, but it's not family first. It's God first and family second. And we have a hard time with that because we think, wait a minute, but but family is family. We do everything together. We eat together. We sleep together. We play together. We watch movies together. We do everything together as family. We travel together. We vacation together. We, we swim together, we, we play, we do all of these things. That's what families do. We study God's Word together. We, we pray and worship together. It's family. We do everything. Need I remind you what it says in Scripture in James chapter 1? Where's family come from? Who designed the family? Who blessed us with our families? Every, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. We can't... We can't miss that message. Remember, as um, we return to our text, as far as the setting, as far as what has taken place, just very, very briefly, by way of a review, the popularity of Jesus has continued to grow, as well as the criticism labeled against Jesus or the opposition that he has faced. We saw last week that the Jewish leaders thought that he was just a bad man. He was a liar. He was actually possessed by Satan himself, which is wrong. We know that the criticism actually came from some of Jesus' own family who thought that he was what? He wasn't caring for his own needs. He wasn't stopping to even take the time to eat. And so they thought he was crazy. He was a lunatic. He was was mad. Mark now returns to the subject of the family here in verse 31, pay attention, listen very carefully 
Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through the end of the chapter, verse 35. Mark 3, 31 to 35. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sisters and mother. Okay, we have a a statement that we use and we hear all the time that blood is thicker than water. What? Blood refers to family. We always stick together. We always protect our own. We always resort to our own. What I would suggest today is that, yes, blood is thicker than water, but we'll see in Scripture that obedience to the will of the Heavenly Father is thicker than blood. Now, now it is easy for every single one of us to see family, which is of utmost importance, to come to a place where family actually becomes too important. Family, which is of utmost importance, it's very, very easy for us to allow the pendulum to swing out of order, and it, and it becomes too important. I, I can give testimony that there have been seasons in my life where I have really messed this order up. And so sadly, I speak from experience where I have allowed what? Family to become too important, to become the focus of my existence rather than God. I've also swung the pendulum, which we'll see at the end, that that we can have God such a focus that we neglect the needs of our family ministry, ministry, ministry. And that's wrong too. So how how do we hold on to this? How do we strike this? Family is important, but it can't become too important. And you're like, did I really hear that from the pulpit before you brand me a heretic? Scripture is explicitly clear for the life of a believer. If you claim to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with everything, that means that, that nothing, no one, is to replace the Lord as the ultimate center of your life. Not even family. It is to be God and God alone. Hear me on this, and you can remember this. The the Lord God is to hold the highest place, the place of preeminence, supremacy, and primacy in your life. You think about the very first commandment. Moses in what? In thunder and, and, and lightning. Received on Mount Sinai, etched in stone. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. You shall have nothing. There shall be no other gods before me. Now, now, it may not seem like much of a temptation to have a little tiny wooden idol or a a stone carved idol that you're bowing down. That, That may not be a temptation for you. But, but it may actually be a temptation to say that, as I've heard this before, we actually, we're not able to worship today because we need to spend priority time together as a family. I've heard that, sadly, on too many occasions. Jesus Christ himself taught reaffirming the first commandment in Matthew chapter 22 and Mark chapter 12. You shall love the Lord your God with what? With all of your heart. Not a portion of it. All of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. You see, it's very, very easy for us to put anything and everything in a position that replaces the affection that is to be in our heart first and formally to the Lord. Anything can become a distraction that in a sense thwarts our fellowship and our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The reformer John Calvin famously defined the human heart as an idol factory. Listen to this, and I quote, 
man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. An idol can be anything that we place ahead of God. And in our fallen nature, it doesn't have to take a whole lot to have something that, what, may not be a wooden object, but it can replace the position that God has alone is to hold in our hearts. That we lose our focus of Him. We take our eyes off Him. It can actually even be good things. I think of the church in in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 3. It says that they lost their first love. Realize that they lost their first love. They were doing all kinds of wonderful ministry. But in doing ministry, they they what were concentrating on the activity of worship, and they lost what the object of their worship. Same thing can happen today. We can take something what? We can take something that is 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 great and miss out on it because we've replaced it with something that is good. So let's look at this text this morning. We begin in verse thirty one. Number one, the family seeks to get his attention. The family seeks to get his attention, to get Jesus' attention. It says, And his mother and his brothers came standing outside they sent to him, and they called him. We kind of parse, take apart this narrative, and we see once again, because of the crowds, there's always crowds that have been following Jesus, that there is limited access to him. Only a few people can actually fit into the house and get close. Jesus apparently is inside the house teaching and he gets word, someone, someone calls in that, that, that Jesus, your mom, is waiting outside and she would like to see you. It seems like a normal request, doesn't it? I think it's quite telling to kind of wonder why, why they're outside in the first place. Did they arrive late and, and lose their seat? Did they perhaps, in a sense, want to stay on the outside? Whatever reason, we know that Mary at this particular time believes. We see from the song of Mary, she knows exactly who her son is. But the brothers at this particular point apparently do not believe. Perhaps if they would have shown more interest, they would have listened, they understood who he was. But as family, what happens oftentimes, we need you. And and there is an urgent responsibility that often goes alongside with family that what? Can... Can, can quickly control the situation. Let's bring a sense of order here. You're working too much. You're too far from us. You need to be brought closer. It says, what, in verse 32, a crowd was sitting around him, and they, they in a sense, communicated or just um, uh, passed on, transferred the message. Your mom's outside seeking you, looking for you. And it becomes very, very clear As to what? With all opportunities, Jesus sees a teaching moment. There's there's a a, a situation that, in a sense, is being unfurled before him, that there is a lesson here that can be learned. Whenever we we see one of those moments developing, it's always kind of like leaned in, like, what's Jesus going to say? What's he going to do right here? I mean, after all, this is family Family has immediate access, correct? We are all about family. We're all about family, but, but not at the expense of what? Losing our relationship or our fellowship with our Heavenly Father. I think as important as it is for me to be a family man, a godly husband, as important as it is for me to be a spirit-led father, I, I cannot do any of those things if I am not in right relationship and fellowship with my own Heavenly Father. I think of an amazing ministry that has been a huge blessing in my life. Focus on the family. For many, many years, have offered resources on how we, in a sense, hold the family together. The problem is, is that I think that rather than focusing on the family, we actually become obsessed with the family. There's a dangerous mantra that exists in our world and even 
in our, in our churches that family is everything. People, I know it's upsetting, but no, 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 they're not. Your family can't redeem you. Your family can't rescue you from your sin. Family is not everything. Christ is to be everything. Family comes second. Hard, hard to say that. Upsetting. I understand, but it's truth. Back to the narrative, we see that Jesus is being called out. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe, maybe people were already kind of clear away, beginning to like move aside to, to let Jesus go out or to let his mom and his brothers come in. But oddly enough, from what we see here, n- no one moves. No one does anything. It's kind of quiet. And again, there's this awkward moment, heavy moment. It's a pregnant moment. Something's going to happen. It's a teaching moment. Secondly, the Lord speaks about who gets his devotion. Number one, we saw the family seeks to get his attention. Number two, the Lord speaks about who gets his devotion. There's no way to miss these words. Um, At first, in all honesty, at a quick read, they just seem they just seem rude. Jesus, Son of God, God incarnate. They almost they just seem wrong. Listen to this: Who are my mother and my brothers? Who's my family? Now, obviously, he's he's not saying I, I don't know who my family is on a human level. He knows exactly who his mother is. He's, he's not showing disdain toward his own mother, like mom just ticked him off today, so he's going to be rude. We know the position and the love. We know the relationship. John chapter 19, when Jesus is on the cross, and he, he cries out and calls out to John, what? Behold, your mother. He's concerned about his own mom. And he tells his mother, Mary, behold, your son. John will take care of you from this moment. So, so you kind of wonder: is it is it like a trick question? Who is my mother? Who who are my brothers and sisters? Has he really lost it? Where is he going with this? Everyone's leaning in. They're listening. They're trying to learn. In a sense, what does it really mean to be like Jesus? To follow Jesus? We understand when Jesus makes the statement following, he looks, it says that he looks around, he looks about at those who sat around him, and he says, here, here. Those that are in the house, those that are closest, those that are leaning in, those that are listening, here are my brothers and my sisters. And he makes the statement in verse 34, whoever does the will of my Father, is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever in a sense understands the priority, whoever is obedient to the order that has been established, he's, he's making a point here, and in a sense it matches every single thing that Jesus has already been teaching. It reemphasizes it. It puts an exclamation mark to what he has been telling everyone. Jesus is saying what? Relationship, the relationship that matters first and foremost before anything else is the relationship of obedience to the will of my Father. Obedience to the Heavenly Father's will is most important. Now what you'll see, a little detail, and, and we don't have the time to look exactly at everything, there, there's two brothers that are present. James, we know who wrote the book of James. And also Judas, we refer to him as Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. What's interesting is that these brothers actually get the lesson that their older brother is trying to teach them. You see, James chapter 1, in verse 1, introduces the, the introduction. And he doesn't say, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a brother of Jesus. He doesn't start with that. How, how is it worded in James chapter 1 and verse 1? 
a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He introduces himself as simply one who serves. The word is the same word that we use for slave or bond servants. In Jude chapter 1, another brother who writes, who's there outside. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 1, he introduces himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Think about that. If your brother is Jesus, maybe you want to play that card a little bit. But Jesus says, no, I'm just here to serve. I'm, I'm a slave too. Oh yeah, I'm a brother to James. We understand here that in this lesson, this moment, that these brothers, they got the lesson. They understand first and foremost what it means. It's about obedience to the will of the Father. Another reference we see in Matthew chapter 7, in in, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching in verse 21. Listen to this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does... The will of my Father who is in heaven. Do you realize that there's an order of priority here and it's evidence even of your own salvation? Think about it. God first, family second. You you mess that up. You mix that up. You're more concerned about fulfilling the will of your family than you are fulfilling the will of your heavenly Father. And according to what it says, it says you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven. When we talk about the Lord being Lord, He is Lord of all, over all. The focus is on obedience to Him and Him alone. Another place that we see this explained, Jesus is teaching Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 and 25 and 26 and 27. You thought the first comment was strong. You, you, you felt the first comment, as, as my initial reading, was kind of rude or, or wrong. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 14. He says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me, listen to this, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot follow me. He adds in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You thought the first statement was rude. You thought the first comment was wrong. Jesus actually uses the word hate here. Now understand that particular word hate. It's not an absolute, it's a relative term. It's not contradicting to the commandment that we are to honor our father and our mother. We're supposed to do that. The word hate, missio in Greek, it actually, it translates literally to love less than. It's not in, in, in abhorring. You, it, literally, there's a sense of order. You better what? Love Even your own father and mother less than you love me. You must love your spouse, your husband or your wife less than you love me. That's the focus. You must love your own self less than you love me. It's best meant in that same word to love less than this. It's meant to, to, to neglect social customs pertaining to family loyalties, which is interesting. How many times, well, we, we can't, yeah, I can't help out with that ministry. I can't be part of that worship service. Yeah, we, we got Johnny's little first birthday. And I'm not saying we don't celebrate. I'm not saying that, but there's an order that says let's teach Johnny how important it is to keep our eyes on the Lord. First and foremost, we don't arrange our whole, our, our, our whole family around worship. Uh, we, we arrange our family over worship. We don't arrange worship over family. Make sure we keep that in focus. Family comes after me, Jesus is saying. There's a high price for following Him, for obeying Him. 
And there's no doubt that Jesus is close in his relationship with his own mother, Mary, but, but we, we understand it never diverted him from doing or accomplishing the will of his own heavenly Father. The same has got to be true of us, willing to forsake everything. I know we, we have to strike the balance. Does this give us license? Does this free us to forsake our family? Absolutely not. If you come away, if you come away with that, you, you've missed the whole point. Do we sacrifice family for obedience to Christ as far as, well, well I, I, I neglect my responsibilities. I'm too busy doing God's work to to ever spend time with my wife or my children, then you've missed it. Absolutely not. If if you do that, you're in disobedience to the rest of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's pretty clear. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. It's pretty clear. In, In obedience to Christ, that's the way that you're going to live. Ephesians chapter 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It says, honor your father and your mother. If, if, you, if you feel that following Christ uh, gives you license to neglect any of those areas, you've missed the truth of Scripture. It continues on in Ephesians chapter 6, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, or exasperate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord's. So understand the importance and significance of balance. I, when I live aligned to Scripture, when I live my life and order my world in, in submission to the Holy Spirit, I am far more valuable to my family when I orbit around God and not orbit around them. And the same principle applies for you and I. And I even so... So be so bold to ask, does your family know the place that they hold is second to your Heavenly Father? Does your family know that God comes first? Yes, family is the biggest, biggest of blessings. But I want to warn you that it actually can become the easiest of idols. And so we hold on to that. To understand that Scripture, if blood is thicker than water, then obedience to our Heavenly Father is thicker than blood. I, I, I am so grateful. I'm delighted that Jesus Christ models this for us. And we even have a picture of that through the communion table. But what, what did Jesus Christ actually Submit to and surrender to. Lord, please remove this cup of suffering from me. We see that Thursday night this week as we commemorate what the, the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. And we know that he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was laying flat on the ground and he's, he's praying with such intensity that literally there's droplets of blood that are pouring out of his pores. Father, please take the suffering from me. But ultimately, there's what? Nevertheless, not what I want. Not what I want. I don't want that. But your will be accomplished. And and so Christ models for us, first and foremost, it's obedience to his heavenly Father's will. We know that we have been given the the, the Lord's uh, Supper, the communion table, as a reminder of what Jesus Christ was willing to do, what He offered for us. We have two elements, basic elements, bread and wine. Jesus sitting with those disciples, those followers, that very last night, the very night that He was betrayed, that Thursday night, it says that He, he took bread, He showed them, and He uses it basically as an object lesson to just... Say, this is, this is a picture of my body. And he broke the bread, and as he broke the bread, he said, this is what's going to happen to me. My body's going to be broken. There's those two words, but it's going to be broken for you. I'm going to allow this to happen for you so that we can be healed. Jesus then, it says, took the fruit of the 
vine and he poured it out. And as he poured it out, he said, this is, is a picture of my blood that will be poured out for you to wash and to cleanse. The blackness exists. The sin that exists in our own hearts and our own lives can be washed. And it's only going to be washed the life-giving bloods of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave that picture to them so that they would remember. They see it. They hold on to it. And then the instruction is what you and and I am to regularly remember this until the Lord comes. And so that's what we do here. As any church that is rounded and founded upon the Word of God, there's, there's only two mandates in a sense to remember as far as what? Baptism, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two ordinances. And the other one is the Lord's Supper. And so if you are here this morning and you are a believer, I would encourage you and invite you to participate and to partake of this bread and this cup that are a picture of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for you. If, if you are visiting today, you're not a member of Big Woods but you've made that decision, please understand you are welcome to this. You're a member of the family of God. But let me also remind you that if you have not made that decision, if you have not acknowledged, you have not been obedient to the Lord, you have not recognized the fact that you are dead in your sins and that the wages of sin is, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you've not made that decision, putting your faith and trust in the work that Jesus Christ has accomplished, then you can do that. And you should do that this morning. I invite you to. Then you can partake. We do it not with a sense of flippancy, joking. There's a solemnness. There's a quiet. Someone has died. Someone who loved you greatly. Now, we know that there is a great celebration waiting, and we will celebrate next Sunday, and we look forward to that. But until that, hold on to the weight and significance of the price that was paid for your and my salvation. I'm going to have the elders come, and they're going to assist um, in serving you this morning. Um, They'll serve you the bread first. I'll ask God's blessing on both the bread and the cup.